The following program contains information regarding medical conditions relating to physical pain and disorders which cause pain. While it is possible to use this information as a self-assessment tool, this presentation is not to be used as a substitute for medical diagnosis or treatment. In the case of any pain, the viewer is encouraged to immediately seek the attention of a physician in order to consider the possibility of serious illness. One morning I woke up in excruciating pain. I couldn't move my head in any direction and I really didn't know what to do. I was standing perfectly still in a store waiting at the counter when all of a sudden my entire right leg from thigh to toes felt like it went to sleep on me. I was doing squats one day at the gym and I heard a pop in the lower part of my back and I woke up the next morning and I was in agony. I was walking with some friends. Uh, we hit an ice, ice patch and I slipped and I tried to catch myself and I remember it was really a wrenching feeling. And I kind of heard a sound and all of a sudden I couldn't get up. I mean, I didn't, didn't fall, by, but my friends tilted me to a car and I was just paralyzed. And uh, I was screaming in pain. I was taken home, I took a cab home and uh, it hurt for about a week. I was walking down the street and I all of a sudden had a serious pain in my leg, which shot, it was shooting down from the lower buttocks down the back of my leg, and it was making it very difficult for me to walk. The pr pain continued to progress for that whole entire day into the next day. When I w woke up and then I couldn't even lift my head up off my chest. I thought that it would just recover, as like when the b blood starts circulating, but it didn't really recover, and as I walked home, with some discomfort, then I found that I had a drop foot, which I never experienced before. And the person I was with, because sometimes I joke around, they said, stop fooling around. I said, I am not fooling around. I cannot control my foot. And that became frightening. The most agony I've ever experienced in my entire life. I basically was, I, I couldn't move. And when I attempted to walk, I was really, hunched over and kind of limping in a way that I had never before. The pain devastated my life. It, it was with me from the moment I woke up in the morning, the pain until the moment I went to bed at night. I had excruciating headaches. I had to stay in bed a lot. Um, I didn't live my normal life like I used to run and, you know, I couldn't go to social functions with my friends. It's. Um intense, it's um, nagging, it's frightening, it's debilitating, um, moves around sometimes, and creates a desperation because it stops you from not only doing your life, your livelihood, but having fun. I remember studying long nights and, um, and occasionally I would get zapped in the middle of a study session and um, it would, I would be walking across campus and just have to stop in my tracks. It was about, you know, nine months in duration where uh, I was severely restricted in what I could do. I'd get up in the morning and wouldn't know how long I'd be up before I'd be crawling back into bed again. Uh, I tried everything for that uh, pain to go away and uh, soon enough I was able to walk around um, with, a, with a hobble, with a limp. and. Uh, it would not go away, and it stayed around uh, for a year. Um, and that's how this chronic pain turned into something which was really uh, debilitating. So I went to see a doctor, and um, he told me to go for an MRI. Um, the MRI was shocking because they found two herniated discs and one bulging disc in my neck. I gradually got worse and worse to the point that I had almost constant like a feeling of dragginess in the bottom of my f leg, like tingling in my feet, and it just progressed and got worse and worse to the point that I went to neurologists and to other uh, physicians, even saw a, uh, sur a ne neurological surgeon who I was sent to, and was ultimately diagnosed with stenosis and prescribed to have surgery. They took an MRI, and sure enough, there's a bulge, there's a herniated disc, L4, L5, 
um, L5, S1. I was diagnosed with, you know, muscle spasms. Um, I did rupture a disc at one point. Um, spinal stenosis, scoliosis, um, all the normal things that uh, orthopedists tell you when they look at, at uh, x-rays and MRIs. Several people really told me I needed surgery. They said there was really no other way. And uh, if I wanted the pain to go away, I had to have an operation. I was told I had a herniated disc and that surgery would be my best option. I decided to have the surgery and it really didn't help. I was still in tremendous pain. Then I was told that scar tissue had formed following the surgery and that that was the cause of my pain. I tried physical therapy. I tried acupuncture. I tried uh, oral steroids, steroid injections. I tried everything until I remembered uh, about a book that I had read or that I had leafed through in, in a bookstore uh, many, many months ago. And this book was a thin little uh, book by a man named Dr. John Sarno, and it said something about a connection between the mind and the back pain. I think I heard about him on the Rosie O'Donnell show. Someone who worked for her had gone to him because she couldn't walk. She had incurable tendonitis, supposedly, in her ankles. And I watched that show, and I thought, I wonder who this guy is. A friend of mine happened to mention Dr. Sarno. And then I bought his books about a month later. And that was the best thing I could have done for myself and for my back and for the pain. A friend of mine went to Dr. Sarno about a month before. And he told me uh, that he'd pay for the bill if it didn't work. And I said, well, just pay for it now because I can't work. I mean, I've done everything. How is this guy, by just going to a lecture, going to do anything? I mean, it was hopeless. I was already on all kinds of medication, anti-inflammatory, painkillers, and uh, it stopped working. And I just thought it was ridiculous. But I had nowhere else to go. Dr. John E. Sarno, a graduate of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Columbia University, is professor of clinical rehabilitation medicine at New York University School of Medicine and attending physician at the Rusk Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine of New York University Medical Center. Since 1973, I have focused my research and clinical practice on mind-body disorders, most particularly a condition that appears to be responsible for the majority of common back, neck, arm, and leg pain complaints. I've written three books on the subject and treated thousands of people with chronic, severe, often disabling pain. Lectures are the cornerstone of my treatment program. And since both my lectures and books have helped large numbers of people to become pain-free, it was concluded that a video presentation of my lectures would be of great value to viewers. That is the purpose of this video and the program you are about to see. I hope that it will help you to become pain-free. Welcome. Let's begin this by talking about why we're all here. Why are you here? Dr. Sano, I've had severe pain in my lower back, which shoots down to my left leg and makes, it, makes my left foot numb for the last seven years. I've had an MRI, and it shows that I have two herniated discs and one ruptured disc. Um, the pain is terrible. It consumes my life. I can't play with my children. I've been told I need surgery. I've read your book, and I feel a little bit better now. Can you help me with this? Mm -hmm. Dr. Sarno, I've had bad lower back pain for about a year now, and uh, the pain went into my legs. And I did take an MRI, and they said I had two bulging discs. Uh, I've tried physical therapy. I've had three epidurals. I can't remember all the di different types of doctors I've been to, mm -hmm. and I'm still in a great deal of pain. Dr. Sano, I've had a uh, s intermittent pain in my right, on my right side, a sciatic pain, over the past several years. And more recently, while I was doing just a mundane activity, I was getting out of a car, matter of fact, uh, and uh, I felt a sharp pain, and my back went out, and I, I was incapacitated for a, a few days. Mm -hmm. I then learned about your book, which I read, and uh, after reading the book, the pain subsided. So I'm here to find out more about 
what you have to say. About a year ago, Dr. Thorne, I was doing some strenuous uh, exercising and stretching to where I actually could touch my chest to the floor, and one day I just heard a pop. And after that, it was just a series of excruciating pain that would come and go. I, too, have been through a lot of different treatments. I've been told I had scoliosis. I've been told I had herniated disc. I've been told I had fused facets, an extra facet. And I just uh, came here to hope that this mm -hmm. treatment could work. I had had a lot of pain for many years and just lived with it. And then one morning, I was in the shower, and I also heard a pop. And I was down and out, and I was paralyzed for 30 days. And when I got well, I went and had an MRI, and they said I had severe arthritis of the spine and did treatments to live with it. And then for years, it went in and out, and was well. I was well sometime, and then bad again. And then recently, I had like a very bad month, and a friend of mine told me about your books, which I had read, and thought, well, I have arthritis of the spine, so it didn't apply to me. But then I started to read it and see that I was on every single page in the book cool. and said I needed to come and see you. Dr. Sano, about 10 years ago, I started having back pain. I would have episodes that would come, and then they would uh, go. About five years ago, I had an MRI done, and it, uh, it revealed a herniated disc, a transitional vertebra, and degenerative disc disease. Since then, I've been in uh, chronic pain, and it's basically consumed my life um, pretty much. And after having tried many, many therapies, um, been told I should have surgery, I shouldn't have surgery, um, I just have nowhere else to go than, than right here. Mm. Well, it's clear that you're all suffering from some very significant and important pain in some part of your body, and I'm here to help you get rid of that pain. You've all been diagnosed with a variety of abnormalities and other conditions, disc problems, for example, arthritis of the spine, fibromyalgia, and you've been told that these things are the cause of your pain. Well, we're going to talk about that. However, after spending decades studying these problems and also treating large numbers of patients with these problems, I've come up with a different diagnosis. There's something else that's causing your pain. We call it the tension myositis syndrome, TMS for short. I'm here to teach you are here to learn. We've adopted this learning or teaching method of treatment because we've found over the years that people will get better if they learn what is actually going on. That is the true cause of the pain. That's undoubtedly why large numbers of people have been able to get better simply by reading one of my books. So this presentation is treatment, developing awareness and understanding our treatments. Before we begin, a word of caution. Pain can have many causes, and it's essential uh, that uh, before one assumes that the disorder we're, we're going to be describing is the cause of your pain, that one will have been studied and examined by one's doctor, and anything really serious like cancer and so on has been ruled out. Uh, I assume that in all of your cases here that that is the case. So let's begin. The first section is going to be on the physical manifestations of this disorder. That is, what is the nature of this physical process that's going on in your body that's causing the pain rather than the many uh, other diagnoses that you mentioned before. We call this disorder the tension myositis syndrome, TMS for short, and I'll be uh, using that term to make it uh, easier as we go along. Actually, if I were putting a name on this today, it would probably be somewhat different because tension does apply to the psychological factors, not muscle tension, but myo does refer to muscle and itis represents a change of state. So it was obvious when we first started working with this that muscle was the primary tissue involved. And indeed, it was the muscles of the neck, the shoulders, the back, and the buttocks, uh, all collectively known as uh, postural muscles. As we went along, however, through the years, it became obvious, and your histories make this very clear, uh, that a variety of spinal nerves can be involved, which means you might get pain down your leg or down your arm, indeed, almost anywhere in your back or chest. 
And then even later, we realized that a number of tendons, uh, any tendon literally, uh, in your arms or legs could be involved. So we were dealing with a very, very different animal than one just involving muscle, which we thought at the beginning. And that's why we use the term syndrome. The word syndrome in medicine refers to any disorder that has multiple manifestations. And by gum, if any disorder warranted that, it's TMS, because with TMS, you can have pain virtually anywhere from the top of your head down to the tip of your toes. This slide has to do with the physical process that's involved in, in TMS. There is a physical process. This pain is real. It's not in your imagination just because it, it's, it emanates. It's induced by something going on in the brain. And what's involved is that emotions in the unconscious, and we'll talk a lot about rage later on, produces abnormal activity in the autonomic nervous system. Now, I have to tell you a word about what that system is. It's the one that controls all involuntary functions in the body. And it's at work 24 hours a day, whether you're asleep or awake. That means that most of the time, it's serving you well. But there can arise occasions, as in this one, in which there's abnormal activity. In this case, it results in reduced blood flow to the involved parts of your body, wherever your pain happens to be, the buttock, the neck, the shoulders, the arm, and so on. The result of this reduced blood flow is that we have mild oxygen deprivation, and I want to emphasize the mild because it's probably only oh, to four or five uh, percent off normal. The result of that, however, is that it produces pain in a variety of circumstances. The muscles uh, may be involved or painful. If a nerve is involved, like the sciatic nerve, then you're going to get pain down your leg somewhere. You may also have numbness, feeling, tingling feelings, Weakness, actual muscle weakness, and the, or the loss of a reflex. These are very common, and this is extremely unfortunate because, in general, when an individual has uh, weakness in some muscle and there happens to be a herniated disc involved, it will, uh, it will be invariably blamed. That is, the weakness will be blamed on the herniated disc. Uh, but as I said, this is extremely common with TMS. And then finally, tendons that are oxygen-deprived can also uh, be painful, and this is a, uh, can be a very severe problem as well. Dr. Sarno, let me see if I understand this. Uh, repressed emotions um, cause changes in the nervous system. That reduces the blood flow, and, and that results in reduced oxygen. That's the source of the pain? Yes, and of course, what makes it difficult to understand at this point is why this happens as a result of an emotional phenomenon, but it does, and of course we're going to be getting into that in great detail in a little while. Yes, it's just exactly as you said. It starts out with a situation involving feelings in the unconscious, and we end up with pain in various tissues. But what about my bulging discs? I've been told that my discs are causing the problem. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I, uh, what I was just saying. And of course, the problem is there's not been an alternative diagnosis around for doctors to consider. And so if a person has pain somewhere in the vicinity of a disc abnormality, well, then they are very liable to attribute the, the pain to that disc abnormality. The fact of the matter is, however, that a bulge uh, anatomically would be almost impossible for it to cause pain. We'll talk more about that later. Dr. Sarno, you're saying that the cause of the pain is emotional. Are you, are you saying that the pain is in my head and that it's imaginary? No. The emotions uh, don't cause the pain. They initiate the process that causes the pain. And that is in your head indeed, but the process is in your body. It's real. And of course, it's a great misconception to say that the pain is in your head. All right, we're going to look at the three types of tissue that may be involved uh, in this disorder. First, muscle, uh, and then nerve, and then tendon. Let's start with the muscles. TMS tends to involve only muscles in the back, the neck, the shoulders, the low back. It does not involve arm muscles, for example, or leg muscles. We can't see the leg down here. Um, and it can actually occur anywhere. However, there are three areas that are uh, most important in this syndrome, and that is uh, the buttock area here, and then the so-called small of the back, and then the shoulders. Remember that the pain of TMS can involve any muscle, however. 
But the commonest areas are down here. Perhaps 60 to 65 percent of patients will have the problem in this area, and that includes the small of the back as well, and about 20 to 25 percent here, and then the rest of them are scattered throughout the rest of the back. The one thing that's important to note here, however, and this made a great impression on me when I realized this many years ago, is that no matter where your pain is in, in these muscles, there are certain muscles that will hurt when we press on them. And I'm referring to an area here, here, in the small of the back here on both sides, and in the top of the shoulders. Now, why that's important is that, for example, someone would come in with pain and they'd say it'd be involving this area. Why in the world would they have pain when we press on the muscles here and here and here and up here? The answer, of course, is that this disorder was originating in the brain. It's the brain that sets up this situation the way it does. And it is not, as we've been saying, we'll say over and over again, the result of some local pathology. I've had severe pain in my leg along with my back pain. Are those muscles involved too? Pain in your leg. Generally, as, uh, as I said, the muscles in the leg are not involved with CMS, but pain in the leg usually means that a nerve has been involved, and that's very common, or a tendon. So it depends exactly on where the pain is. The second type of tissue which may be involved is nerve, and this can be extremely important. What you see here is that any of the spinal nerves from the neck down through the thorax and the lumbar area. Uh, you can see the beginnings of the sciatic nerve here, and we'll go into greater detail about that in a moment, and uh, the brachial plexus up here. Dr. Sarno? Uh, I've had tingling down my leg, and I really found it to be quite frightening. I mean, who knows what it could be? The doctors couldn't find anything wrong. That's a very common symptom. Actually, it's, it is fairly frightening, but it usually means that the nerve that's involved is very mildly involved, but this is very common with TMS. It means that the brain has, uh, there's been mild oxygen deprivation to the nerve that feeds that part of your leg. Now here, we see in much greater detail the sciatic nerve is uh, formed by branches from five spinal nerves, sacral two, sacral one, lumbar five, lumbar four, lumbar three. That means that if your brain decides to involve this area and, and these spinal nerves and or the sciatic nerve, you're going to have symptoms down your leg. Pain, numbness, tingling, weakness, the loss of a reflex. If the higher spinal nerves are involved, those that do not feed into the sciatic nerve, then you may get symptoms in the upper front part of the thigh, and indeed some patients have symptoms in the groin area. If we go even higher, uh, and these are involved much less commonly than the lower ones, then you may get pain across the abdomen or uh, further up, pain across the chest. Here we see the five spinal nerves that contribute branches to make up the brachial plexus. Brachial plexus up there in the shoulders are not like the sciatic nerve down in the leg. All of the nerve function is going through here down into the arm and hand. So if these spinal nerves are involved or the brachial plexus is involved, and I'm inclined to think in most cases where the pain is in the neck and shoulder and arm and hand, it is the brachial plexus that's involved rather than the spinal nerve. However, very, very commonly, when people have pain in the neck, shoulder, and arm, and their x-ray shows a spur uh, in the spine here, the pain will be attributed to that spur, and the patient will be told that they have a pinched nerve. That's a very, very common diagnosis. Dr. Sarno, I was told that I had a pinched nerve, and that was the cause of the pain in my arm. Are you saying that that wasn't? Yeah, well, that's precisely the point. Actually. It, it would, I think, be very difficult for a spur in that area to cause any trouble because the, the foramen, the hole through which the nerve passes, is usually large enough and so that it's got to be almost totally obliterated to cause the pain. Now, as I said before, the problem is that in the absence of an alternative diagnosis, usually what will be done is that the, uh, the pain will be blamed on some obvious structural abnormality, and that was, that's what happens with the pinched nerve. Now, these are nerves. This is a disc, and that's what the purpose of this illustration is, to talk to you a little bit about discs. Unfortunately, we must, because it's an extremely common diagnosis, that is, various abnormalities of the discs, which often leads to surgery, as you well know. 
The disc is placed by nature between two vertebral bodies in order to take up the shock. It also allows for twisting to occur. Unfortunately, in certain areas, as in the middle of the neck and the lower end of the back, the discs tend to wear out. And when they do, then you may have this thick material inside the disc. It's a little bit like toothpaste pushing its way out. When that happens, you get a bulge. Now, as I said before, bulges really, because of their location, can cause a, a, any problem. However, this may then give way, and then this material comes out. And uh, indeed, it may come out and even surround the nerve that's nearby. And the point is this. That is uniformly believed to be uh, the cause of pain. But in the many, many patients that I've treated with this disorder over the years, I have found that in the majority of cases, the herniated material is innocent. It is not causing the problem. Uh, instead, uh, there is TMS going on involving that nerve or invol involving the muscles above it. I was diagnosed with bulging discs, and th uh, they said that that was the source of the pain. So you are saying that that is not what is causing the pain? No, as a matter of fact, in the next visual, you'll see uh, some very strong evidence as I said, personally, I don't see how it could possibly uh, cause the pain. This is, uh, gives direct reference to what you were asking about. This group of doctors under Maureen Jensen published a paper in 1994 in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of our most prestigious medical journals. They did MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging, on 98 people with no history of back pain. And you can see that only 36% of these people had never had back pain. Only 36% had normal discs. The rest of them had bulges at one or more level, or they had protrusion, or they had actual extrusion. Now, I have had many, many patients with extruded, not just protruded disc material, and it turned out that this was not the cause of the pain. Now, this is very, very important information because it indicates that these uh, problems involving, or these abnormalities, let's put it that way, because they're not really problems, involving the discs are really part of the normal aging process. But you know, this aging process uh, starts uh, when you're in your teens, believe it or not. Most radiologists do not expect to see a normal disc space between the fifth lumbar vertebra and the sacrum down at the end of the spine. And that's because these changes are a little bit like, uh, some people have said, like gray hairs of the spine. In other words, it's part of the normal aging process. Dr. Sarno, I had surgery for a herniated disc, which was pressing on my sciatic nerve. The surgery didn't help. I still have pain in my lower back and down the back of my right leg. It's very frustrating. Um, now they tell me that the disc material that was removed has been replaced by scar tissue, mm -hmm. which presses on the nerve and causes pain. Is that true? Well. The, the scar tissue is undoubtedly there, but in my experience, that's totally benign. Uh, the chances are that you're having your continuing pain because you've got TMS, not because of the scar tissue. You know, that, that's brought up from time to time, and I usually say to patients, just think of the millions and millions of people that have had chest and abdominal surgery for a variety of things. Do they ever get pain because of scar tissue? Enough said. Now, the purpose of this is to talk about the various tendons that may be involved. Remember now we've talked about muscles, we've just finished talking about nerves, and now we talk about tendons. This, again, is a very common part of this syndrome, and it's important for you to know all of these things, because if in the future you should ever get some kind of a recurrence, for example, pain around the knees, you want to be able to say, well, maybe that's TMS, I better call up the doctor and find out. There are many tendons around the knee, and this is one of the uh, popular spots uh, for TMS to occur. The pain may be blamed on something called chondromalacia, which is a roughening of the underside of the kneecap, the patella. It may actually be blamed on a minor tear of the meniscus, that is the cartilage in the knee joint. These tears are apparently very common. And sometimes they're big. In that case, something needs to be done because that usually will interfere with the movement of the knee. But in most people, they're minor. And therefore, one must be aware of the fact that uh, the pain uh, of TMS may be blamed on such a thing. 
You can have involvement of the tendons at the top of the foot. You can have involvement of the tendons at the shoulder here. It's very common there. Again, they're blamed on something called bursitis or more recent, recent years, since the MRI has come in, uh, more commonly the, the pain will be blamed on what's known as a rotator cuff tear, and some of those come to surgery as well. So it's very important to know. Now this is the site of a modern epidemic known as carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, no one uh, in this group apparently is suffering from that disorder. But we want to talk about uh, things of that sort because epidemics uh, characterize what happens when people get mind-body disorders, which TMS is, and when they're not, they're not recognized uh, by the medical profession for what they are, when instead the blame is attributed to some structural abnormality or something of that sort. Dr. Sano, uh, my father's uh, had bursitis of the shoulder for the past several years. Are you saying that uh, this is TMS? Very likely because there's no reason, actually, uh, the bursitis diagnosis is not is made uh, nearly as frequently as it used to be. Now, more often, they will attribute the pain to a rotator cuff tear. But yes, it's very likely that your father's pain is due to TMS of the tendons. You can see lots of tendinous structures attaching to the bone there. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sarno, a few years ago I had severe pain in my knee and I was told I had a torn meniscus. I was afraid to have surgery and eventually the pain went away. Well, that's a perfect example of what I said a moment ago. You know, it's interesting, the brain will often choose the site of TMS where it knows something is going on. Now that sounds weird, uh, but probably that's one of the reasons why people get so much low back pain because of the disc abnormalities there. Uh, and indeed, um, rotator cuffs do tear, but apparently it's not painful at all. And it's uh, fairly common in elderly people. Uh, and so uh, one must be very suspicious that an elderly person complaining of shoulder pain and is told that it's rotator cuff tear, that, that this is again probably an example of TMS. A very, very important subject here. It has to do with when you have the pain, that is both in terms of time and also under what circumstances. And what I've found over the years is that what determines these is not the physical problem of TMS, but actually how you have become programmed, or to use the technical term, uh, conditioned a la Pavlov. And look at some of these common ones, sitting, and what could be more benign than sitting? And yet many, many patients will complain, uh, patients who have low back pain, that the sitting brings it on or makes it worse. Standing in one place, walking, of course, although it's very interesting, depending on how you're programmed, some people will say, if I have problems doing these, I feel better when I walk. And then the next patient will say, Walking brings on the pain almost immediately so that I have to sit down. Now, these patients may have exactly the same situation in virtually the same place. These are things that one will, that will bring it on. Uh, and in some patients, they tend to have more pain during the day than at night. Uh, some patients will tell you that the pain gets worse as the day goes on, and others will tell you the very opposite, that it gets better as the day goes on. Mind you, we're, we're talking about essentially the same problem. And there are dozens of other patterns. Why is this so important? Because you must not think, if this is your pattern, that sitting is bad for your back, or standing in one place is bad for your back. It's essential for you to know that's only the way you be, have become programmed. Conditioning, to give you the idea, you all, I'm sure, have heard of Pavlov's famous experiments where he uh, would present his dogs with food and then ring a bell at the same time, and he got them programmed to expect the presentation of food with the ringing of the bell. Well, after a while, of course, he would ring the bell, not present food, but the dogs would begin to salivate. Well, now, what you must understand is that sitting may be your bell or walking or a certain time of the day or night. And that's important so that you don't think that this is something that you've got to get over, some physical problem you've got to get over. All you have to do is understand 
that this is what you've gotten, go through the therapeutic process here, and you will become deprogrammed, deconditioned. I play tennis hard, and I have no pain. Yet when I bend over to pick up a laundry basket, I get pain in my lower back, and I was wondering why. Is this what you're talking about? This is exactly what I'm talking about. The tennis is not the bell for you, but picking up a laundry basket is the bell. I had a patient once who did heavy labor all day long. He owned his own uh, truck, and he would load and unload and deliver, and he never had pain when he did that. He only had pain when he leaned over the, the, the sink to shave in the morning. That's how he was programmed. Yes. Dr. Sarno, I could sit in my car and drive for hours, and I'm fine. But as soon as I'm at my desk for more than 20 minutes, I have to get up and walk around or lie down. Is this what you mean by conditioning? One could almost wonder if it wasn't your job that you didn't like. I like my job. Uh, but that, <laughs> you do like your job. I do like my yes, job. Yes, that's, that's a perfect example of <coughs> conditioning, exactly. Now, another very important clinical characteristic of this disorder has to do with what's going on at the moment that the pain begins. Most people with this, I'm sure all of you have had the experience of having episodes of pain. In other words, you'll have an attack and then uh, you'll get better, uh, probably not entirely better, but considerably better. And then uh, a few months later, uh, you'll have another acute attack. And it's these acute episodes that we're referring to now. This pain can come on, the pain of TMS can come on gradually. But in many cases, the person is doing something, lifting something or carrying something, playing a sport. Uh, many patients, you mentioned tennis, uh, will say that I reached for this difficult shot and I suddenly got this pain in my back. Or performing some sort of exercise routine or lifting weights. Very often minor injuries. Uh, the brain will uh, take advantage of the situation and start up the process. The point is that you must know that these things are triggers that they are not the cause of the pain. That's a very important distinction. What do we mean by trigger? It means that your brain was ready to start this process up. And remember, as you're going to see, the process has to do with psychological things rather than physical things. And the brain is actually very clever about this because it wants you very much to associate your symptoms with something physical. I hurt myself. There's something wrong with my back. I hurt myself doing one of these things. And that's why this is a logical time for it perhaps to start the process up when you happen to be doing something physical. And the other thing that I should mention with reference to this is that people often talk about uh, injuries, old injuries, and they'll refer back to something that happened maybe five or ten years ago and think that every time they get a recurrent attack of pain now it's because of that old injury. And once more it's important for you to know that the body tends to heal itself thoroughly, completely, that we have wonderful mechanisms for healing and there's no such thing as recurrent pain from an old injury. Dr. Sarno, a number of years ago I know I overexerted myself by picking up a box that was too heavy for me to pick up. And I've had pain since. Uh, are you telling me that, I, that I, I didn't hurt or injure my muscles? I'm saying exactly that. That was your trigger. Uh, in fact, you say you've had pain ever since. If you had hurt yourself, you probably would, the pain would be gone in a few days and that would be the end of it. There's a very important principle involved here, however. People often think that it's dangerous to lift up weights, it's dangerous to lift things, and so on. If you can lift something, and if you are a weightlifter and it's a very heavy weight, it means it's not dangerous for you. You can't hurt your back in any way. If you can't lift it, it's too heavy for you. If you can lift it, it's not too heavy for you. But this is a very common misconception that you can hurt the muscles in your back from lifting. What happened was that that's when your TMS began. Uh, Dr. Sarno, there must be uh, some weight that's too heavy to pick up. Can I hurt myself by lifting or picking up something that's too heavy for me? If you can lift it up, it's not too heavy, as I just said. All right. We've completed the first section now. Uh, we've talked about the physical manifestations. And let remind you once more that the pain of TMS is real. It's physical. When we come back, we're going to go into the question of who gets TMS.
at first, it just, it just was so radical to think that the pain was not coming from the, my discs in my neck. And I, you know, everybody, physical therapists, everybody had told me that's where it was coming from. So for someone to say, that's not at all where it is coming from, it was shocking to me. When Dr. Sarno told me that the herniated disc was not the cause of my pain and that the scar tissue following surgery was also not the cause of my pain, I was actually relieved. He said it was TMS, and I had hope then that the pain could actually go away. I believed Dr. Sarno when he said the arthritis was not the cause of my pain, because when he said that it, if it was, I would be in pain constantly, and I thought that that was absolutely right. Why does the pain come and go? Sometimes it would even go from the right side to the left side. When I was told by Dr. Sarno that I had TMS, it was like being told you won an award. I really had tremendous confidence in him. And when I heard his diagnosis, I knew that I was going to be OK. I can't say that I was totally surprised. The thing that really blew me away was that he had a method for helping you deal with it. Once you recognized and you accepted that that's where the pain was coming from, he had an actual plan to help you rid yourself of it. The pain was always at its worst when I was sitting behind the wheel of my car driving. The fact that I'm prone to road rage probably has a lot to do with that. I had to stop believing in all the things that they told me that I shouldn't do, like sitting in chairs that were not good for my posture. I was scared to bend, I was scared to move, I was scared to lift, I was scared to stretch, I was supposed to sit and stand. I mean, everything was programmed fear. I was totally programmed. When Dr. Sarno referred to these things, I found myself in many of them, particularly for me, one of them lifting of heavy objects. You know, everyone had told me, don't lift this and don't lift that, or you might cause further damage to yourself. So. I refrained from doing all of those things. It was extremely hard to put aside all the doctors and all the literature that told me this was a physical problem. But it was a challenge that I was ready to accept for one simple reason, nothing else was working. All right, now we're going to take up the very important subject of who gets TMS. Unfortunately, it tends to occur very widely and goes under many different names. Uh, this is the reality, uh, and I make no apologies for it, although certainly I'm very often uh, asked by doctors how this disorder can involve so many different parts of the body. Most low back and leg pain, and as I said before, that probably 60 to 65 percent of people who get this get it in the low back. Most pain involving the upper back, the neck, the shoulders, and then radiating down into the arm. The whiplash syndrome, and we'll have occasion to speak more about that in a little while because that's a very important subject. And most of the common tendonitis, uh, we've said here ankle, knee, wrist, elbow, shoulder. I've seen this in, in virtually any and all of the tendons in the arms and legs. Dr. Tarnow. My sister had to quit playing the piano because every time she sat down to play, she would get incredible pain in her right wrist to the point where it became unbearable. And she was told that she had tendonitis, but she never got this pain when she did other activities. Could this have been TMS? Yes, very likely. And that's a perfect example, incidentally, of, of programming. In other words, uh, she was programmed to have the pain only when she sat down at the piano for whatever reason. Um, but that's a, a very, very good example of a TMS tendonitis. Now, other disorders that appear to be part of this syndrome. This TMD stands for temporomandibular dysfunction. Uh, it used to be known as TMJ, and that might be more familiar to a lot of you, temporomandibular joint syndrome. It refers to pain uh, in the face, uh, and uh, I have uh, I've found that many of my patients who come in for other reasons will give a history of having had that. And indeed, when you palpate the, uh, the, the jaw musculature here, they still have a little bit of tenderness in that area. So that's a, a very common manifestation. Something called a piriformis syndrome, which refers to pain in the buttock area, 
uh, blamed uh, on a, a muscle that's in there, and actually I find this uh, to be a no diagnosis as far as I'm concerned. The carpal tunnel syndrome, we'll also have more to say about that, which involves the wrist and produces symptoms in the palm of the hand. Repetitive stress injury, of which carpal tunnel syndrome is uh, one of the manifestations, but there are many others. We'll talk more about that. Fibromyalgia, which is a painful disorder, is very much part of TMS, uh, but it happens to represent a more severe manifestation of TMS with pain in many different locations rather than located in one or the other, as with most people who have this. And also, there appear to be emotional factors associated with this. Very often, people with fibromyalgia will have sleep disturbances, anxiety, depression. This is a real problem because this is of epidemic proportions in the United States today. It tends to occur in women uh, more than men. Actually, the ratio is about 10 to 1. And it is an enormous public health problem because uh, the patients are informed that the cause of this disorder is not known, and they have to learn to live with it. Myofascial pain, that's a thing that's been around for a long time, refers primarily to pain somewhere in the back area here. And then post-polio syndrome, which is extremely interesting. One sees this in, in people who have had uh, polio with residual involvement, usually of the lower limbs. We used to see many of these patients uh, years ago. We don't see very many now. Uh, but those that do have it and who happen to have pain anywhere in the leg or in the low back, uh, they will say that this somehow is related to the polio. And in my experience, this simply is not so. 30 years ago, uh, uh, when, one, uh, when I saw a number of patients with polio who had all kinds of deformities in their legs, a shorter leg, a wasted leg, and so on, but they never had pain. It's because of the spread of these pain problems now that people with old polio, whose limbs tend to get weaker as they grow older, are probably uh, having TMS because of their unhappiness about what's happening to them physically. Uh Dr. Sarno, I was told that the cause of my fibromyalgia was unknown and that I'd have to live with it. Are you saying that isn't well, so? Well, that's precisely the point. That's apparently the general view out there in medicine that the cause of fibromyalgia is not known. And that's uh, simply because I don't know uh, how many doctors are aware of TMS, but that's because in general they do not accept uh, the, the explanation that TMS is the cause of fibromyalgia. And it's perfectly clear from all the patients that I've had with this that that's exactly what's going on. Then they tend to get better. Now, we've sort of made reference to this already, and this is uh, very, very important. In other words, what are the things that are going on in the body that are liable to be blamed for the pain? Osteoarthritis is what we referred to before, uh, the normal aging changes gray hair of the spine, so to speak. Uh, and they are routinely blamed for pain if there's nothing else to blame the pain on. And it is essential for you to know that this is not a painful disorder. This is not like rheumatoid arthritis, which is entirely different and which is a painful physical disorder. Disc abnormalities, again, you remember the visual that we had before pointing out that uh, study that was done by Maureen Jensen and her colleagues where 64% of 98 people with no history of back pain had a variety of disc abnormalities. This demonstrates the fact that these are probably very common. But if you have TMS in the low back, for example, and if there is a disc abnormality demonstrated on your MRI or CT scan, then inevitably you will be told that that is the cause of your pain. Scoliosis is an alignment abnormality. Uh, and it occurs uh, more often in women than in men. Actually, it usually starts in teens. And the alignment that I'm referring to, when you look at the spine from front, it tends to, it, it's straight up and down. When you look at the side, it's curved in a different way. Well, what happens in scoliosis is that there's a curvature sort of like that. It's almost like an S-curve, and there are various kinds. Teenage girls who have this do not have pain, but teenage girls have a way of becoming adult women. And if an adult woman has pain in the back and scoliosis at the same time, uh, they will be told that that's the reason for the pain. In my experience, this simply is not so. 
This is another alignment abnormality. In this one, there's a small piece of bone missing. In this one, there's an extra bone. In none of these cases do I find that these are responsible for the pain, but again, will always be blamed for the pain. I was told that I had scoliosis, and that was causing my back to hurt. So you're saying that the, uh, it's not the curvature of the spine that's causing me the pain? That's exactly right. In my experience, it is not. And uh, oh, I've seen many, many women with this disorder, and it's clearly not the cause of the pain. Now, these are additional structural abnormalities that are routinely blamed for pain. This refers to the fact that as we get older, uh, the canal, the, the bony uh, canal at the lower end of the spine tends to get narrow, and that's because of the extra bits of bone that grow in there. It's very common. And uh, I think in the, all the years that I've been doing this work, I've seen perhaps one or two patients in whom the stenosis was the cause of the, of the pain. Actually, in those cases, it was usually a neurologic change that was much more important than the pain. And these were very, very elderly gentlemen in their late 80s. In general, I find that this is not the cause of pain. Arthritis of the hip joint, again, this is a real problem because uh, once more, uh, the arthritic changes in the hip joint may not be responsible for the pain, but if a person has TMS involving that area and the x-ray shows the arthritic changes, uh, invariably uh, the pain will be blamed on those arthritic changes. So this is something we always have to be careful of. Rotator cuff tear, uh, we uh, have already mentioned the fact that this is a common uh, diagnosis in people who have shoulder pain. We've already also mentioned the fact that minor tears of the, uh, the cartilage in the knee joint would be blamed for the pain, and chondromalacia, roughening of the underside of the kneecap, often blamed for pain, but in my experience that these are due to TMS in the vicinity involved. Dr. Sarno, you mentioned the knees. I have back pain and I have knee pain, but they never occur at the same time. Why is that? Well, that's a perfect example of the way TMS works, because in general, the brain only needs one site of pain at a time. And uh, I've had many patients with stories like that, uh, that uh, there are two different places, but they don't seem to hurt at the same time. And that's the reason they're both due to TMS. Neither of them is due to an underlying structural abnormality. If you have TMS, it means by definition that there's nothing wrong with your back. Now that may be hard to believe when you've got severe pain, severe pain to the point of disability. In that regard, I might say that paradoxically, TMS can cause more severe pain than anything else I know in clinical medicine. As a matter of fact, many of the structural abnormalities that are blamed for the pain couldn't possibly cause the amount of pain that people often have with TMS in the widespread areas, the whole lower back and going down one leg. So as, uh, as strange as this may sound, if you have TMS, it means that there's nothing wrong with your back. What you call TMS is causing my pain. Is that doing any damage to my body? Glad you asked the question, a very important point you will recall that we said that the physical reason for this is mild oxygen deprivation. The result is that although we get symptoms, pain, numbness, tingling, weakness, and so on from this, we do not have nerve damage. Uh, in all the years that I've been doing this work, I have never seen a patient who had any evidence of permanent damage, either of the muscles. The muscles are actually very, very tough, but uh, uh, nerves are much more sensitive but I have never seen a case of permanent damage from involving of, uh, involvement of nerves with TMS. Sometimes I'm in incredible pain. It's hard to believe what you're saying. Could mild oxygen deprivation be causing such severe pain? If you bear in mind how important oxygen is to normal physiology, then perhaps it won't be so surprising that a, a, even a small deficit in the amount of oxygen feeding an area can cause severe pain. And remember what I said a moment ago. Paradoxically, this disorder can cause more severe pain than anything I know of in clinical medicine. Yes. 
I don't understand, Dr. Sarno. I had surgery. Are you saying that even after surgery, there's nothing wrong with my back? Again, that's very important. Uh, I've had, of course, many, many patients through the years uh, who have had surgery prior to coming to see me. And I have to tell you, and I hope that it's reassuring and comforting to you, that I do not believe the surgery does any damage whatsoever. So that you can uh, rest assured that all of your symptoms are coming from TMS. Now, we've uh, mentioned carpal tunnel syndrome on a couple of occasions. And I have said that uh, this is an example of TMS working at the wrist. Something interesting, you notice here that between the years of 1989 and 1994, and this is when carpal tunnel syndrome began to pick up steam as a disorder, so to speak, there was a 467% increase in people claiming disability. And you see this bit of information came from the business section of the New York Times, because the insurance companies who are having to pay these disability claims found that this to, to be a totally unexpected phenomenon. They never uh, counted on this at all. What happened is that larger and larger numbers of people were getting carpal tunnel syndrome. And here it is, a manifestation of TMS. But that is the way mind-body disorders like carpal tunnel syndrome, like low back pain, neck pain, and all the others we mentioned, they tend to spread in epidemic fashion like that when they have not been identified for what they really are, and believe it or not, if they happen to be in vogue, that is also a factor. And that's why you get something like this with this monumental increase in incidence over a period of five years. Dr. Sarno, why didn't people who worked on typewriters get carpal tunnel syndrome? Exactly, why did not the small army of men and women who pounded typewriters from the beginning of the 20th century never developed the carpal tunnel syndrome. And certainly a typewriter was a lot harder to work, particularly in the early days, than a computer keyboard. Oh, I forgot to mention, that was the major uh, source, so to speak, of carpal tunnel syndrome. It was blamed on working at computer keyboards. Actually, what's happened since then is that almost any repetitive job will bring forth this, so that you've got uh, people who work with screwdrivers are now getting carpal tunnel syndrome uh, because of that repetitive motion. But, of course, the answer to your question is it's obviously that this is part of TMS and these mind-body disorders spread in epidemic fashion. Now, here's another epidemic, which again is quite remarkable. In this one, and this again, the information was published in the New York Times, a great medical journal, you know, I get a lot of good information from the New York Times about what's going on medically. Here, Little Norway, with a population of only 4.2 million people, had 70,000 people claiming disability based on whiplash. Now, what is whiplash? You're in a car, it's hit from behind, and no fractures occur, no dislocations or anything of that sort. But sometime thereafter, sometimes within minutes and sometimes within a few days, you begin to have pain in the neck and in the shoulders. Of course, the accident is blamed for the pain. However, instead of this resolving in a matter of a few days, the patients will often have the pain go on for weeks and months and so on, and people become, can become disabled. Well, now, when this happened in Norway, the doctors were absolutely astonished at what was going on, and they couldn't understand how such a thing could happen. Except that they wondered if perhaps Norway's very generous social medical insurance system might somehow be responsible for it. So what they did was to go to a country uh, that actually did not have a similar social medical system, Lithuania. And they went to a large city in Lithuania, got the names of 202 people who had been involved in rear-end collisions, 202 accident victims, one to three years before the study. They then went out and found so-called controlled people who had never been involved in such an accident, uh, 202 people. They matched them with these people for age and sex. And then they asked some questions. How many of you have never had neck pain? And you see the numbers are almost identical. 
which means that in Norway, whiplash syndrome was of epidemic proportions. In Lithuania, it didn't exist. When they asked the questions of how many did have pain, the numbers were fairly close. Now, this is an incredible phenomenon, but it demonstrates exactly what I've been saying to you. You all have back and neck and shoulder pain. You are part of an epidemic that's been going on in this country for many years and has actually been picking up steam. And how does this occur when the disorder is not recognized medically for what it really is and when it happens to be in vogue? Yes, sir. So it sounds like what you're saying is there's really no such thing as a uh, whiplash. Is that, is that what you're saying? It sure looks that way to me. Now, it has become clear through the years that TMS is only one of many, many different physical uh, situations that are the result of what's going on emotionally. And we call them equivalents. That means the same psychology is responsible for these things as well as the TMS. And as you, go in, as you will see, that they are very common things. I have found that most of the common headaches, tension headaches, migraine headaches, and incidentally, there's a very different physiologic mechanism for those two. In tension headaches, it appears to be the circulation of the small blood vessels in the scalp. Whereas in migraine headaches, something happens to a blood vessel within the substance of the brain. And yet, it's been my experience that the psychology underlying them is exactly the same. It's the same psychology that underlies TMS. Many common skin conditions, we've just lifted acne and eczema and hives here, but there are probably others that are uh, not as well known as these. It seems as though the skin is very sensitive to what's going on emotionally. Cardiac palpitations, these are the ones that turn out to be very normal and they're fairly common. I experience them myself. It's a skip beat or something of that sort. Uh, and once an individual has been assured that there's nothing wrong with the heart, you can be quite comfortable that it's probably being initiated by emotional factors. Common allergies, hay fever, dust, molds, and so on. And this always raises eyebrows. Uh, but in our experience, these allergic reactions are stimulated by the same sort of thing uh, that produces TMS and these other things. And a tendency to frequent infections. Now, it's interesting. The allergic reactions are an example of hyperactivity hypersensitivity of the immune system. In fact, that term is often used. Whereas the tendency to get frequent infections and colds is obviously an example of hypo, of less efficient activity of the immune system. And the crazy thing about all of this is that either of these things can occur as a result of what's going on in the mind. Dr. Sarno, hay fever is due to things that we breathe in. How could it be caused by stress? Well. That's why I said before that this one often raises eyebrows because people say, just as you have, well, what about the pollens and so on? But think about this. Suppose there are 10 people standing in a field of pollens and only three of them begin to sneeze. What's the difference between the three and the other seven? The difference is that the brain in this instance is using the immune system to produce symptomatology, whereas in the other seven people, it doesn't have to do that. So the tendency to, to react to the substance that you're breathing in is brought on by emotional factors and other ones. And of course, everybody is familiar with the common upper gastrointestinal problems, heartburn, reflux, which has become very common in recent years, hiatus hernia, pylorospasm, I actually put ulcer at the end of the list, although they're all part of the same thing. People these days are being told that ulcers are caused by bacteria. Well, I believe the bacteria are there, and incidentally, they're not there in everybody who has ulcers. That's something to bear in mind. I think they're there, but they're part of the process. What initiates the process, as far as I'm concerned, is still psychological factors. And then there are the lower intestinal things, the irritable bowel syndrome, colitis, constipation, Frequent urination, of course, should always be checked out. In fact, any new symptom should always be checked out with your doctor. When we say that these things are equivalents, we mean that these can occur and are not due to any uh, disease process or infectious process, something of that sort. Prostatitis in males, 
every good urologist knows that in the great majority of cases, prostatitis is tension-induced, psychologically induced. Dizziness, ringing in the ears, can be serious, should always be checked out, but most commonly will be due to psychological factors. And then, as we said here, there are many others. These happen to be only the most common. Yes. Dr. Sarno, I've been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. I also get pains that come up and down my leg from time to time. The two symptoms seem to alternate. They never happen at the same time. Are they both caused by TMS? They're not both caused by TMS. They are both examples of physical reactions that are being stimulated by the brain for psychological reasons. So they are equivalents of each other. And as I said before, the brain obviously feels in most cases that it doesn't require two physical things to be going on at the same time. So you either have the irritable bowel syndrome or you have the evidences of TMS in your leg. Yes. So what you're saying is that emotional factors are at the root of all these things. That's exactly right. Now, of course, at this point, we haven't talked about what they are. If we want to talk in very uh, general terms, we can say tension or stress, uh, uh, because indeed uh, uh, those are terms that are, that are better known. Yes, things like that are responsible for all of these, as well as TMS. Once more, if you have TMS, it means that by definition there's nothing wrong with your back. It means the structural abnormalities that have been blamed for the pain in your case are not causing the pain. It means that the reason for the pain is a mild um, physiologic alteration in the circulation of blood to various parts of your body. And that is harmless, but potentially extremely painful. Dr. Strano, yes. what you're saying is I should put aside what I've been told about what's been causing my pain? Yes, as a matter of fact, I think that's a very good phrase. In general, you would probably all be wise, since you have TMS, to forget the things that you've been told about the cause of the pain and what's good for you to do and what's not good for you to do, what you have to do to protect your back, and so on. These uh, bits of advice were obviously all given with the best of intentions, but they're all based upon a different diagnosis. And therefore, if you were to do well in getting rid of this problem that you have now, you would do well to forget everything you've ever been told. Yes. Dr. Sonner, you're saying that there's nothing wrong with my back, then why does my back hurt so much? Because you've got TMS. And that means because there's mild oxygen deprivation to the muscles and perhaps the nerves back there. And that's probably as good a way as any of ending this section about uh, who gets TMS, about the various disorders that, uh, that are blamed for the pain when it's really due to TMS. Now when we come back, we're going to go into the all important and of course the crucial subject what is the psychology behind this disorder? I didn't really think it would be possible to be cured by Dr. Sarno. Uh, after being told I had arthritis of the spine, I had two frozen discs, I've had an erupted disc, I had uh, torn a torn knee meniscus. Uh, I didn't know, understand what Dr. Sarno's lecture would do for me. It was difficult to believe that the pain I was experiencing was something that was psychological when it was so severe. To hear Dr. Sarno say that there was nothing wrong with my back was probably the greatest thing I ever heard because I knew that that meant the pain could go away. I was in shock, disbelief. I had so many different emotions because I, I hear I had an MRI that showed damage done to my neck and he was saying something totally contradictory to what anyone else had said to me in the past. When Dr. Sarno said there was nothing wrong with my back, he said that after having validated the severe pain that I had been in and the restrictions that I had been experiencing in my life. And he also said, I believe I can help you. You know, let me explain what the source of the pain is. I was open to hearing another alternative at that point. I had recently been to my own surgeon um, 
he had examined me and after a rather perfunctory exam said, you're fine, there's nothing wrong with your back, you know, go on your way. Um, he left, I sat there and I cried because I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. And now we come to what is obviously the most important part of this presentation, and that is what is the psychology behind this physical process? I bet you didn't know you had three minds. We all do. We know all about this one. That's obvious. But we're totally unaware of, of course, are these two. And the one of these two that we are interested in in this presentation is this one. Very often these two terms are used interchangeably, but they shouldn't be. This one refers to feelings, emotions, below the level of consciousness. While this one is very interesting, it has to do with extremely important functions that make us what we are. The ability to communicate speech language, the ability to think as we do, to create, to remember, and so on. All of that goes on in subconscious mind and more, but that's not what we're interested in discussing today. About the only thing that the subconscious is, interest, is, uh, is of interest in terms of what we're doing now is that this is where we learn. And as we said before, you are here to learn because it is your knowledge of what's going on uh, that is going to free you of your symptoms. It's impossible to understand this process unless we know a little bit about how the mind is organized. And you're, I'm sure, familiar with these terms that were first used, uh, uh, invented, so to speak, by Freud. And he was talking about different qu qualities or capacities of the mind. This one we're very familiar with. Incidentally, this one is both in the conscious and in the unconscious mind. It's, uh, we, we can refer to this as the conscience. It tells us what's right and wrong. And we're going to get into the whole question of the kinds of personality factors uh, that are important for this. This you might call the captain of the ship. It's sort of the part of the mind that seems to make decisions uh, that, that mediates when there's conflict between different parts. And there certainly is conflict because this refers to the residual child in each of us. Not very flattering as we'll see in a moment when we look at some of the characteristics of this residual child. But it appears to me that the conflict and the battle between these two is probably responsible for this disorder. When we generate emotions, and we do generate emotions in the unconscious, when you're angry consciously, you know about it. But what you don't realize is that you can also be angry unconsciously, in which case you will be totally unaware of it. Any emotion that's generated in the unconscious that is undesirable, embarrassing, and unacceptable for whatever reason, is repressed. That's a normal process. And as you can see, uh, what goes on with TMS has to do with this process of repression. These are some of, as you see, those uh, troublesome, undesirable, unpleasant characteristics of the unconscious id. In other words, the child, or that represents, you, we, may, we may use the, the idea of a child as representing the overall characterization of the id. It tends to be illogical, irrational, I mean just the opposite of what we try to be consciously. It has characteristics of the wild and indeed even of the savage. There is left over in every one of us the propensity or the possibility, that is, for savage behavior. Narcissistic. This may be one of the most important characteristics. What it refers to is that the id is totally self-involved, has no interest whatsoever in being an adult, in being concerned about others, and so on. It's motivated entirely by pleasure and also by the lack uh, of uh, things that tend to be unpleasant. Now that's extremely important in this. This goes along with that, of course, it's selfish. We've already mentioned that it's only pleasure oriented. Intolerant of the pressures that we may have to be perfect or good. Intolerant of the pressures that we may have from life which we understand very well. If I were only allowed one visual for this whole presentation, 
I would select this one because it really tells the whole story of TMS. We've talked already about what it is. And we've said that, of course, it comes about as a result of brain activity. Now we're talking about why the brain does that. And what I have concluded after many years of working on this problem is that the brain is aware of the existence in the unconscious of this. That sounds like a strong word. In fact, the fact that we don't feel any of this, that consciously we're totally unaware of it. There are people that say, I never get angry. There are other people that say, oh, I get angry a lot. But they're not talking about this. This is rage, and it's in the unconscious mind. Now, we said a moment ago that the brain will automatically repress any unpleasant, undesirable emotion. But for some reason or another, the brain's a little worried about this because this is big and it's strong. And indeed, like all emotions in the unconscious, it's threatening to come out. And that threat is what causes the brain to produce TMS. The purpose of the TMS is to enhance the process of repression. It's like reinforcements. It's like calling in the Marines. The brain is afraid that the repression is not going to work. This is going to escape. This is going to become conscious. You are going to be overtly enraged. And that's the brain considers a very dangerous situation. And so it creates TMS as well as all the equivalents that we've already talked about. We said they all serve the same purpose. What is that purpose? To make sure that this remains repressed. Uh, everyone knows I get angry all the time. Are you trying to say that's the cause of my pain? No. As a matter of fact, I'm saying that's not the cause of your pain because your anger uh, that you're aware of is up here. It's the rage that's down here that's the cause of your pain. Now, indeed, that anger up there may be related to this, but it is not the same as this. There's a very great difference. I don't feel rage. That is, I don't feel like I'm an angry person. How come I have back pain? Well, because you don't feel this because it's in the unconscious mind. Incidentally, one thing I neglected to say, I think we are all doing this. People who have not only TMS, but who have these other equivalents, and I'm afraid that there probably are people who develop other physical things quite different from this, uh, who probably have this as a factor in that. This, I believe, is part of the human condition in Western society. I think if you went to a totally different culture, I mean really different, that you might find that this does not exist. But in Western society, and as we know, the influence uh, of Western society and capitalism and so on spreads more and more around the world. I think those values uh, that they get from us uh, put them in, into the same category as we are. <clears throat> now, while it's important to know about this, because this is obviously the thing that brings about or, or brings about the necessity for the TMS. Now I want to emphasize the fact that it doesn't do much good to dwell on this. Nothing we can do about it, it's there. What we have to think about are the factors that are responsible for that rage, and we're going to look at these one at a time. Anger generated in infancy and childhood, personality traits, and the realities of life. So yes. if we all have rage, why doesn't everybody have TMS? We all have rage, and everybody doesn't have TMS because some bodies have stomach trouble, and some bodies have lower intestinal trouble, and other people have skin problems, and other people have headaches, and other people have allergies, and I can go on and on and on. We all have something. And as I said before, unfortunately, and uh, I, um, one can't go into great deal, detail about this, I think that this unconscious rage probably figures in a lot of more serious things, but that's not our subject today. Now we're going to look at each of the sources of this rage, and the first, of course, the experiences of infancy and childhood. It may seem hard to believe that even an infant can generate unconscious anger, 
But if the very important process of bonding between the infant and the mother, and I'm talking about the first few months of life, is not good for one reason or another, an infant can certainly generate anger. Now the thing to remember about anger generated in the unconscious, it is it, it, that it's there forever. The unconscious, so to speak, is timeless. Any emotion that was generated 30 or 40 years ago of any significance is still going to be there. And of course, the anger is a very important one. Now when we get into the later years of life, it's obvious that physical or sexual or emotional abuse is going to be responsible for, for very significant amounts of anger. And anger that's generated day in and day out becomes rage. So a child who's uh, either neglected or who, who has uh, uh, parents who are putting too much pressure on it or are sometimes downright nasty emotionally uh, will generate enormous amounts of anger and that they, they stay with us, that stays with us for the rest of our lives. What we refer to here, the poor parenting, is what I was alluded to just a moment ago, and, and that is the fact that parents very innocently sometimes uh, can behave in a way uh, that causes a child to generate anger. The feelings that may result are not only uh, rage but shame, feelings of inferiority and helplessness. I think the childhood years probably are more important than we realize because a lot of subtle things go on and the the abuse does not have to be of a major kind in order to leave some sort of a scar uh, for the rest of the youngster's life. This one I believe to be probably the most important of the sources of anger. I'll say anger because remember that anger accumulated day in and day out becomes rage. What we're talking about here is that we tend to put ourselves under pressure, self-imposed pressures. Remember that word. Because what happens is that pressure of any kind is resented enormously by this leftover child in each of us. Remember what its characteristics are. You can imagine that it's not going to want to tolerate any kind of responsibility, any kind of pressure. So if we have a tendency to ask a great deal of ourselves, don't get hung up on the word perfectionism. Some people recognize that they are perfectionists. But if you find that you put yourself under pressure, if you find that you demand a great deal of yourself, if you find that you're very self-critical, that's what we're talking about. And that is what is resented enormously by the unconscious mind. By the same token, and I tell you when I realized this, it took me by great surprise, and it was quite a while before I came around to realizing that this could be just as powerful as this in inducing uh, internal anger. That is the need to be a good person, to want people to like you, to have a tendency to do things for people, have the care, caretaker propensity. Both of these produce an enormous amount of internal anger. I find that those two are the primary psychological factor in most of the people that I deal with. Last summer, I collected statistics on 100 consecutive patients that I saw over the summer. And that was far and away the most common uh, set of characteristics that were responsible for this. There are other things that may contribute, actually, to the internal anger, a tendency to feel guilty, feelings of dependency which are not met. And incidentally, that's one of the things that's also characteristic of the unconscious mind, that deep down inside, again, like the child, we would all like to be taken care of. These are enraging. Yes? Dr. Sarno, you've uh, described me to a T. I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I'm very driven. But this drive has really worked for me in helping me be successful in business and in my relationships and in my personal life. So are you saying that this personality trait is actually causing unconscious rage? Well, of course, there is the story. I mean, this is the situation that we humans have to deal with on the one hand and I guess I didn't say it these are obviously wonderful personality traits for a variety of reasons they get us where we want to be they often set us up very well with our 
people that we're related to, either personally or in business and so on and so forth. So surely these are wonderful traits. And, uh, but, but the fact is that the, the reality is that they have an, another totally different reaction inside. And it's our inside reaction, unfortunately, that's responsible for this syndrome. Dr. Sano. Yes. Um, I, I would just like to understand why the drive to be perfect and the need to be good would be qualities that would cause rage in the unconscious. Only because of the way our minds are organized. Only because there's a leftover child in every one of us that resents this. Um, and it is this, uh, this, is, these, this is the theory that I've come up with to explain this because I really can't explain it in any other way. It must be that the pressures on this leftover child in us are uh, enraging. And that's what happens. And of course, this is generated in the unconscious so you're not aware of it. And finally, we come to perhaps the easiest one to understand, pressures that are the result of our life circumstances. No one needs to explain this. Family matters, marital harmony, actually just maintaining a good relationship is a pressure. Being a good parent to your children is a pressure. Being a good child to your parents is a pressure. So there doesn't really have to be trouble, but obviously if there is trouble, that means that the pressure is going to be even greater. Taking care of elderly parents, this is such a common thing because one's feelings about the parent usually are warm and so on. We're assuming a very good history and a good relationship. Uh, but if they require a great deal of care, it's like the same thing that is involved in taking care of children, particularly uh, young children. An enormous amount of care is necessary. You react to it consciously in an appropriate fashion, but your nasty unconscious is just the opposite. It says, that's too much work, it's too hard, it's too tough, <coughs> so on. So we must be aware of these two very, very different kinds of reactions that we have. Financial problems, obvious. Illness, obvious. These two are not so obvious, and that is that very often the contemplation that we're getting older, particularly when you get into some of the later years, although I think that I've seen this in people in their 40s and 50s, the contemplation that you're getting older can be very, very disturbing at an unconscious level, and we get angry. We get angry at things inside that aren't just exactly the way we'd like them to be. And the same thing goes to the awareness of mortality. Dr. Sarno, yes. um, a lot of this is very real to me. Are you saying that my unconscious mind is furious at life's pressures? That's exactly what I'm saying. Not logical, not reasonable, but that's, really? I'm afraid, what goes on. Yes. Dr. Sano, you just mentioned a lot of obvious things that might be causing pressure in my life. But, but do you mean to say uh, that the personality factor is still the most important? Well, just think about it. You're a parent, for example. Now, if you're a parent that doesn't give a hoot, then you're not going to be generating a great deal of pressure or, and you're not going to be getting angry on it. But on the other hand, if you're a parent who's very conscientious and who's very concerned about doing the right thing all the time, there's the answer to your question. Right. And that's why I believe that of the two uh, sets between the personality traits and these life pressures, the former is probably the more important. It's the way we are and the way we react to everything that goes on in our lives. Now, we talked uh, before in the section before this one about the physical equivalents of TMS. What I'm about to tell you now would probably be uh, controverted by people in the field of psychiatry or psychology, but I can't help that because I've made these observations based upon many years and thousands of patients. And I've come to the conclusion that anxiety serves the same purpose as TMS. And indeed, I've had patients who have either one or the other, but not the two at the same time. The same thing goes with panic attacks, which is for a sort of a form of acute anxiety. Same thing goes for depression. 
People get depressed. Actually, the relationship between depression and anger has been known for a long, long time. That's been in the literature for many, many years. And so it should not come as a surprise to anybody that depression is similar to, that it serves the same purpose as TMS. Phobias, you know what they are. Obsessive compulsive disorder, the need to do things that one is driven to do things on a repetitive basis and so on. That's fairly familiar. Uh, I have very good reason to believe, again, because I've seen one or the other in some of my patients through the years. Eating disorders, they're not really physical. I mean, these people who are overeat or undereat, either bulimia or anorexia nervosa, are responding to emotional processes going on inside. And chronic fatigue syndrome that's been with us a long time. A hundred years ago, they called it neurasthenia. I think we ought to go back to that. Because, and that's probably why they don't use that phrase these days. Because the word neurasthenia suggests that this has something to do with the nervous system. You bet it does. With the central nervous system, with the brain. Yes, sir. So, Dr. Sarno, if I understand you correctly, the same psychological processes that cause these symptoms also cause TMS? That is, is my impression. That has been my experience. And as I said, I've got patients that, uh, that demonstrate this uh, equivalency between the two. Yes. All right. Now remember what I said before. This is the culprit in terms of the fact that it's the physical symptoms or these other things, the, the, the equivalents we just talked about, are responding to the presence of this in the unconscious. But remember, it does no good to focus on this. You must know about this. And in your thinking about this, we'll talk about that in a moment, you must know about this. But it's also a very important for you to know that this is not the basic cause. It's the things that are producing the rage uh, that are very, very important here. Well, we've now gone through the section on psychology. Uh, and in a moment, when we come back, we will go into that, again, also very important subject of what it takes to get over this. When Dr. Sarno said that unconscious rage was the source of the pain, I wasn't aware that I had any unconscious rage. It was a difficult thing for me to accept. Um, rage is not a word that I would use um, with respect to myself. Uh, and I actually feel that I manage my emotions very well. I didn't really know what that meant when he talked about that. Uh, I mean, I always thought it was on the surface. I thought I always expressed myself. Uh, I had no idea what he, what he meant. And it took, took, a, took a little bit longer for me to understand what he was talking about and for me to really get into his program. It wasn't difficult for me to accept uh, the idea that there is such a thing as unconscious rage. Um, in fact, I had always um, suspected uh, or been in tune with the connection between your emotions and your physical body. I never thought of myself as being an angry person. I don't lose my temper. I don't go off into rages. And so I really didn't understand that. There's a difference we learn, I've learned, between conscious rage and unconscious rage. The unconscious rage is made up of our entire life, our entire being, and things that are happening presently. I almost, I, I mean, you feel like a failure. Like, I can't deal with my emotions, I can't deal with the pressures that I have in my life. Um, it, it's not a good feeling, and it doesn't fit within the context of who I see myself as. When Dr. Sarno speaks of things that make you happy on the outside and furious on the inside, in some ways I could identify with it as I thought about it. What I am aware of is that I'm a conscientious person, a polite person, and a very non-confrontational type person. I tend to hold back all my negative feelings and my anger, and that probably contributes to the process that causes the pain. When Dr. Sarno spoke of the life pressures and personalities, as far as personalities go, in the lecture he was saying, if you're a perfectionist, you're, if you're a people pleaser, if you're all of these, a do-gooder, and I mean, it could have been every single one. I practically had all of them. And then in addition to it, he spoke of life pressures, and he's talking about illness and moving and different things like that, and I have them as well. I think 
these are the residual things that go into the unconscious rage that we feel. That brought together with things that manifest in their childhood and the stresses of everyday life, I think is what brought upon me the pains which I have come to feel. When I started to think about my sources of rage or anger, I started to go through the different phases from infancy to self-imposed personality and to daily pressures in life. And I started to make the connection that although I'm a very driven person and I'm very responsible and I like to do the right thing, that these are all nice things that people will look at and say, oh, well, those are good qualities to have. But I realized that they are really a source of my rage because there are things that you put on yourself that you really sort of can't measure up to in a way. After thinking about it, I believe the biggest source of my unconscious rage is my family. It's surprising to think that the people that you love the most can also contribute to your unconscious rage. But that's probably true. I work in a family practice with my father and my older brother. And I'm expected to do things a certain way. And I have certain family obligations that I can never really get out of. And that probably causes a lot of unconscious rage. Great periods of stress in my life, psychological stress, physical stress, has always manifested itself in some sort of pain syndrome, mostly having to do with trunk or limbs. I'm not a headache type person or a stomach ache type person necessarily, but mostly back aches, pains in arms, pains in legs, pains in neck. After having listened to him talk, I could see myself on every view graph, uh, in every bit of his description, and I actually realized that what I was not dealing with was actually still there and manifesting itself in different ways. Well, here's what you've been waiting for. <laughs> How do you get better? We said at the beginning, didn't we, that this presentation is the treatment. Now, what I hope to do now is to make clear to you why that is so, because when you come to think of it, that's a pretty preposterous kind of thing, isn't it? We, can, we, we, we associate medical treatment with medications, surgical procedures, injections, physical exercises, all sorts of things. And here we are treating you with words. However, as you well know, um, we've, through the, the things that I've written, we've done this for many years with thousands of patients. And therefore, we've seen that, that it can be successful and we've tried to understand why it's successful. It's clear now, isn't it, that the rage is responsible for the symptoms. Therefore, if this were to come out in some fashion, it's perfectly obvious, isn't it, that there would be no necessity for the pain. The problem is that it's not going to come out. Therefore, how can we possibly get better? Ah, yes. So, Dr. Sarno, if the rage comes out, the pain goes away, how can I get my rage out? Yeah, well, that's the point. You can't. Because the process of repression assisted by the physical symptomatology works. And it's only under extremely rare circumstances that the rage uh, does come out. And I'm going to describe a case like that for you in a moment. But under normal circumstances, and this is why people continue to have these symptoms and can continue to get depressed and anxious and so on, is that it's still there and it's going to stay there. Okay? What we have to do is try in some fashion to get these symptoms to stop even though the rage remains there. That's the secret. Now, I said that I was going to tell you a story. It's a very sad story in one way and yet in another uh, uh, a, a hopeful story. This is about a person, a woman, who had been sexually abused uh, as a child and had totally repressed, the experience had been so terrible, had totally repressed the memory of this for many, many years. Then it happened, and she must have been, oh, in her early 40s at this time, that she began to remember. 
and um, she decided that she would attend this meeting, this encounter group of other women in her community who had been victims of incest as well. And she said it was a very emotional experience. Um, and on the day that she went to this meeting, she began to have back pain. Now, she knew all about TMS. She had been through the program. She said, well, I've got nothing to worry about. I mean, I know what this is. It'll probably go away because I know what it is, but it didn't go away. Over the next 48 hours, as the rage got closer to the surface, the pain increased. And she really didn't understand it. And then, of course, something happened. What I said almost never happens, happened in this case. She literally had an emotional explosion. And her description of this, of course, uh, which is in one of my books, uh, um, uh, is very moving. She reacted and cried and screamed in rage. She wanted to cut her wrists and die and never come out from under the covers. And she carried on like this. She was having an emotional explosion. And as she did, that excruciating pain disappeared. Amazing. Now, before I knew about this case, I had already concluded that the purpose of the pain was to make sure that this didn't come out. But boy, this certainly demonstrated that that was true, that that's exactly the way this works. Because as soon as this terrible stuff came out, her pain disappeared. All right, now you're going to say to me, well, make my rage come out. So my pain will disappear. But as I said, I can't. Yes. Hey, Dr. Sarno, I fly into rages all the time. How come my pain doesn't go away? Yeah, because the anger that you're generating up here, you're aware of, and that has nothing to do with this. The anger that is responsible for this is in the unconscious, and that's very, very different. Indeed, the anger that you're generating up here may be a reaction to this. It may be what the psychologists call a displacement. But the point is, any anger that you're aware of has nothing to do with TMS. All right, now we come to the crucial question. If my rage doesn't come out, how am I going to get better? Why do I get better? Now, bear in mind that people have been doing this and have been getting better for a long time, for many years. And also bear in mind that there are people who read one of the books and get better. Now, you ask yourself, how can that be? And the only explanation that I can come up with is that if the rage doesn't come out by teaching you about this, in a sense, we must be going in. We are breaching this. Well, we're breaching it intellectually. You're not feeling this rage, but you're being told about it, and you're being told how big it is. And you're learning about all the things that are responsible for it. Apparently, that's good enough. And indeed, when that is not good enough, it's a signal to us that we've got to do more exploring about those things that are responsible for the rage. And that's why 20 to 25% of the people that come into this program are going to be working with one of my psychologists. So this is almost a proof of the way the thing works. If the material under there, if the processes under there are strong enough, that are producing the rage, then we're going to need to do some additional work to get at the root of what's behind this. Yeah. Dr. Sarno, how am I going to get better if the rage doesn't come out? By learning about the rage and the reasons for it. The rage doesn't come out, we're going in. Yes. Dr. Sarno, I, I just find it hard to believe that just by learning about something, I can make physical pain go away. I have no other way to explain what we have observed in thousands of people over the years. There is no other ex Actually, there might be another explanation as the exact mechanism of it. But this is, this we know only from what we've seen, from what we've experienced with a large number of people over many years. All right, now, as part of this process, in other words, you've got to do some things. I'm telling you about this now, but uh, as you'll see in a moment from another visual we have here, uh, you're not going to walk out of here free of pain. 
You have to think about all of these things for a while. And the first thing, I don't have a real physical problem in the usual sense of the word. That's why we said at the beginning, my back is normal. Secondly, I understand now about what's going on psychologically. I understand about the rage and the things that are behind it. And I understand that this is normal. This is normal for me. It's normal for virtually everybody in the Western world. Dr. Sarno, um, let me see if I have it. Normally, if my back hurts, I want to put ice or heat on it or lay in a hot tub. What I think I hear you saying is that that's not going to help me. And in fact, it may actually delay my recovery. Is that right? It could help you uh, momentarily to get a little relief from your pain. But in the long run, that's exactly what it'll do. It'll stop you from really getting better because you'll be focused on the physical. And as we've said, this is not a physical problem. This is a psychological situation with physical manifestations. All right, now, how do we go about it? What we mean here when we say think psychological, this is not easy to do, I acknowledge. But as you're going through this in the weeks to come, and you're going to be working on this on a daily basis, whenever you find yourself registering thoughts about the pain, try to force yourself to get away from that and to think about the things that we're talking about now, about the psychology behind this. This may sound silly, but talking to your brain is a good idea. Patients have told me that they do this, and it seems to be helpful. Think about it. It's sort of your conscious you talking to your unconscious you. A lot of people find that it's very helpful to make a list of all the pressures in their lives. And again, you're going to review this on a daily basis. Be sure you put at the top of the list your own personality characteristics because they will inevitably be the most important of the pressures. You're all getting a study guide. You should work with it every day. And remember that this is something that you have to do. Nobody can do it for you. That's what's very different about this. As we said before, conventional medical treatment the doctor will do something to you, for you, give you something, and so on, and then you take it. You're a passive recipient. Here, you are active in this process. You are the most important part of this process. You are essentially going to cure yourself. We're simply telling you how to go about it. And then this is very important, and that is, at the appropriate time, you'll resume normal physical activity. When is that appropriate time? What I generally suggest to people is they wait until the pain is pretty much gone and then gradually introduce their physical activities again and try to get back to where you were uh, before you ever had any, any problems of this kind. Remember, you cannot hurt yourself. Let's say you start doing it a little bit too soon. Well, the evidence that you started a little too soon is that you'll get some pain. Well, fine, you know that that's, you're programmed, you're still programmed, and so what you do is back off, wait a little while, and then go back to it again. Dr. Sarno, yes. what will this study guide tell me to do, and how can I work on this on a daily basis? Well, you set aside the time each day, and the study guide is going to suggest certain things for you to do. So you read a certain number of pages of a book each day, remember to constantly think about the rage, remember to look at your written list, and so on. It'll sort of help you, keep you organized in your studying and thinking in the weeks to come. Dr. Yes. Sano, uh, I've read your book, Healing Back Pain, uh, and it was very helpful to me. As a matter of fact, it virtually eliminated my pain. So you, uh, do you recommend that we reread any of your books? And if so, uh, what particular sections do you think would be most helpful? Well, uh, again, uh, follow the, the guide, uh, the, the program and the guide, because that will make suggestions. What, what I usually suggest is that uh, the first time or two around, you read the whole thing after that, um, I, I recommend just reading the psychology chapter and the treatment chapter and keep going over those. You know, repetition appears to be very, very important for this. I found this out over the years. And that's why it's important to keep working on this on a day-to-day -day basis. Keep thinking about these things. And uh, 
It will help to drive the concepts in. It will help to reprogram your unconscious mind. Yes? How can I think psychologically when I hurt so badly? It isn't easy, I know. And actually, uh, I will prescribe pain-killing medications for people as they're going through this program if the pain is very severe. So you should certainly take advantage of that and use something like that. I do not prescribe the, the anti-inflammatory drugs or tranquilizers or things of that sort. I think the important thing here is to have your pain reduced so you can concentrate on your thinking and on your studying. So, as we said, make sure that you find time each day. It is very, very important. I've had people call me up and say, I'm not better. Well, have you been working on the program? Well, I've been too busy. Well, you can't expect to get better if you don't do your homework. Review your pressure list every day. Don't give up. It takes time, and that's another thing. Of course, naturally, some people are anxious to have it be over with. Well, it may take time. And as we said before, start your physical program when the pain is almost gone. Yes. I'm very excited about the idea of getting back to exercising, but I'm also a little afraid. How would you recommend that I go about getting back into it? Okay. Start very slowly and gradually. As a matter of fact, I'm glad you brought this up because I have had patients tell me that the pain went away fairly promptly, like in about two or three or four weeks. But it took them months before they could get up the courage to go back to doing everything that they did before. So the point is, Take your time and do it a small amount at a time, a little bit at a time. But don't give up. As I said before, if you try something and you, can, and you get the pain back, then say, well, I'm not quite ready. But if you stick with it, you'll make it. And that's what these patients all tell me. When they stick with it, eventually they make it. Doctor, I understand what you're saying, but on a deeper level, I'm having trouble accepting this. Every time I go for a bike ride, the next day I ache all over. Is it that my muscles aren't ready? No, it's that you're still programmed, and remember that at this stage of the game, you're very early in the game. And therefore, you can expect that you will react to these physical things the way you have, you know, for months and, and years gone by. So the point, point is that to work on this, do your studies, do your homework, and give it time. And then a few weeks down the pike, you try and see what happens. Yes. Dr. Sarno, I understand that TMS is the source of my pain and I need to get back to full activity, but what about my herniated discs? Remember what we said before, the herniated disc is like gray hair of the spine. It means nothing if you're in this program, if you've gotten this far. In other words, in the great majority of the cases, these disc abnormalities are not abnormal. They are normal abnormalities. They're things that happen as you go through life. Yes. Dr. Sano, um, we keep on hearing about the time. How much time does it actually take for the uh, process to start working? Well, I, I hate to tell you that this is extremely variable. And of course, naturally, we all like to have things be as concrete and solid. If I do this in two weeks, I'll be fine. And some people, it goes away after they've been through the program in a matter of three or four weeks. In other people, it takes uh, two or three months. And in other people, it takes longer than that, particularly those that have to work with a psychologist. So the best thing to do, I know uh, it's terrible to be so uncertain, the best thing to do is to say that I'm going to do this, I'm going to do my work, and try not to focus on the amount of time that's taken. That may actually slow you down a little bit. Yes? Dr. Sarno, what if the pain just doesn't go away? Well, that will indicate that some of the stuff going on inside is just stronger uh, than we think and usually uh, that brings on the recommendation for psychotherapy. These therapists are trained to help you look inside and indeed to actually feel some of the feelings that you've been unable to feel. Uh, what I see this as a kind of bleeding off of some of this anger, some of this rage in, in small amounts. Well, you'd be glad about this. What you don't have to do to get better. First of all, you couldn't change your personality if you wanted to, but you don't have to, obviously, in order to get better. You certainly don't want to change, or most people don't want to change their lifestyle. 
You can't feel, remember, rage that's in the unconscious, and you can't express what you don't feel. But to reiterate, this is not what, what it requires to get better. Knowledge is what it requires, awareness, information. Yes? Dr. Sarno, as I understand, I don't have to feel my rage or express it. I just have to accept it. Exactly. Accept the fact that it's there. You sort of have to imagine. Um, imagination is important in this instance because we don't feel these things. But you get into the habit of realizing that this pain that you have now is because of that rage that's down there. Yes, that's what you have to do. Yes. Dr. Sarno, everything you're saying is actually starting to make sense. And uh, I understand it, but I'm not sure if I believe it 100%. Uh, to what extent do I have to believe your diagnosis in order to get better? Unfortunately, you have to believe. Uh, the term, you know, is a little unfortunate, but there really is no other way of saying it. You have to be able to say, I know that this is what's going on. Because if you don't, your brain is just going to keep on doing what it's been doing. Just continue the old ball game. Now, in that regard, uh, many of the people that I who have worked with in the past have said, you know, I see the logic of this. It makes sense. But, oh, I just can't get out of my head that I've got that disc back there or there's something else back there. That's really your brain trying to keep you involved in this. And so what you have to do is to just keep working away at it. This is a very important point. I am trying to, what I'm doing is trying to, to, to convey to you a set of ideas. And we do this so that when these ideas are accepted, when, they're, uh, have, when they have been uh, sort of digested by you and taken in, that your brain is going to stop producing this. In other words, this is really a sort of exercise in preventive medicine. It's what it's going to prevent next week's pain and next month's pain and next year's pain. Rather than this, I don't want you to learn a set of uh, uh, words to say uh, and say, once the pain is there, now if I say X, Y, and Z, the pain will go away. That's what I characterize as aspirin treatment. We don't want that. What we want you to do is something more fundamental, to get these ideas on board so that you will not have the pain in the future. That's what we mean by this. Yes? If the idea is to focus on the long term, what, what do you do when the pain is there? In the short term, take painkillers if necessary and keep working on your program. That's really all you can do. The point of this bit of poetry is uh, simply to establish the fact that your unconscious mind, the poet's way of saying that is the heart, is slow to learn what your swift conscious mind beholds at every turn. In other words, I hope that as a result of this presentation, you're all going to have a very clear idea of what this is all about and how it works. Now what you have to do is convey that information into your unconscious mind. And your unconscious mind is going to be slow to pick it up. It's even going to be resistant to pick it up. Um, as was brought out by your question. So give it time and work on it. Nova? Yes. Dr. Sarno, I understand now rationally what you're saying is the true cause of my pain. But why is the unconscious so slow to uh, understand these ideas? First of all, it doesn't want anything to change. And secondly, that is the nature of the way we're built. As a matter of fact, just think about it. If we could change things in our unconscious mind just like that, we'd probably all be psychotic in a week because everything would be changing immediately. You'd be hopping from this to that and so on. So actually, there's a bit, it, it, it's actually a good thing that the unconscious is slow to accept these things. It, has, it needs time to evolve. It's a wonderful phenomenon, the placebo. It's Latin, you know, and it means I shall please. And what it refers to is the fact that even a useless treatment can produce good results 
if one has faith in the treatment. Now, you might say to me, yeah, it's based on blind faith. Why then don't, doesn't everybody use placebos to treat people if they're so powerful? And indeed, they are powerful. Placebos have been known to reverse cancers. And the answer, of course, is here that the result is almost always temporary and of course that means that it's bad treatment. So we don't want placebos. I don't want this to be a placebo treatment because I want you to have a long-term permanent result. Yes? In my almost uh, 20 years of back pain I've tried a lot of treatments and some of them didn't work, and, but some of them did, but none of them ever really lasted. So I guess this is what you mean by I think so. Effect, That's very, right? very common. I think that many of the treatments that people have uh, that, are, that are addressed to this as a physical disorder often give them some temporary relief. But that's precisely the point. They don't get better, and that's why we are so assiduous in making sure that this is not a placebo program. Now, this is the opposite. And this is a very, very interesting thing. Of course, we referred to this earlier when we talked about the fact that people will get pain when they lift something up heavy or something of that sort. Uh, they are often under the impression uh, that uh, this is a bad thing and so they'll get pain. Uh, but many, many other things that are common things, bending, lifting, uh, running on a hard surface, and dozens of others. One should, of course, be wary and this is why I suggested to you before that it would be a good idea for you to forget everything that you've ever been told about the reason for your back pain. Doctor, I sleep on a super hard mattress at home. Um, whenever I sleep at a hotel, the next morning I wake up with back pain. I have always thought this was because it has a soft mattress. But listening to this, maybe this is a nocebo for me. You bet it is. It's a nocebo for you. And the other thing to bring in here is that that's how you're programmed. So nocebos work through the programming process, the conditioning process. Dr. Sano, um, when I do experience pain, it seems that the pain starts to be more severe when I'm walking on a hard floor as against when I'm walking on a floor that's carpeted. Is that an example of what you're talking about? That's an example of what I'm talking about, and again, as with this gentleman, you're programmed to expect it under those circumstances, and so that's when you're going to get it. Exactly. Remember, the brain tries to keep this process going. Oh, there are dozens and dozens of these. Once more, let me repeat, try to forget the things that you've been told. The back is not easily injured. As a matter of fact, it's probably the strongest part of your body because you're up on your feet all day long, and that means that these muscles have to be working all day long. Your tummy muscles don't work, and that's why a lot of people get a rubber tire around the front here, because the tummy muscles aren't working all day long, but your back muscles are. This is not true. 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 And this is not true. In other words, these are some of the many things that people are taught about what goes on in the back and what does not go on. Dr. Sarno, I've been told that you should never bend without bending at the knees first. Is this correct or is this also a myth? I believe it's a myth. Uh, and it's amazing how many people do that. I mean, virtually everybody, when I'm examining them in the office, when they come up, I'll always bend the knees first and come up. It is not true. I haven't been bending my knees for years, and I'm still, I'm still here uh, and don't have a back problem. Yes, sir? Dr. Sarno, I often hear people say, my back went out. Is this an example of what you're talking about? Well, actually, that phrase is easy to understand because very often people will get sudden, sharp pain in the back, and not infrequently, they'll hear a noise. Now, I wondered about that noise for a long, long time. And uh, I, I suspect that it may be the result of what happens when there's a manipulation in the back, you know, and you get sort of like cracking your knuckles, only this is cracking your knuckles in the back. Your back did not go out. That's impossible anatomically. 
what happened was that you had the sudden onset of TMS with severe spasm of the muscle. Dr. Yes, sir. Sano, I can't tell you how many pro professionals have told me not to do everything that's on this list. Now you're expecting me to just assume that <laughs> that's all incorrect and I can do all these things. It's been my experience that you can ignore all of this. Yes, sir. I hear you, you uh, telling us that these are all myths, uh, but when I'm in pain and my back hurts, I'm frightened to bend over for fear of making my back worse. Well, of course you are, but you're now in a new mode. You're now in an educational process, and you're going to try little by little to put all of that behind you. That's what you have to do. It would be hard to overestimate the importance of this factor in this as, in, as well as in many, many other uh, medical situations. Fear makes everything worse. And when people have a back pain history, they fear what the MRI shows. They fear hurting themselves because they've been under the impression that that's what's been happening to them over and over again through the years. They fear one of those acute attacks such as we described just a moment ago as when the back goes out. They fear doing things physically and of course as time goes on this usually gets worse and worse. And they are afraid of what's going to happen if they continue to have this problem, what's going to happen to my life, my job, my family, and so on. So it's extremely important that all of your fears in the process, in your studying, in your educational process here, that you try to overcome all of these fears. Another very interesting thing, if your pain should go away but you continue to have any of these fears, it is going to come back. Yes? Fear is really a big issue for me. Am I going to have to get over my fear of all these things before I can be pain-free? Oh, no. You can probably be pain-free, and, and it may take you a while to get rid of these. But it's something that you want to work on. That's why I said before, if your pain goes away but you still remain fearful, the danger exists that your pain will come back. This is something that may take you quite a little while. But you sort of work into it gradually the way you work into your physical program gradually. I thought you'd be interested that in a follow-up survey that was done recently, six months after, uh, on these 85 patients, 52 are women, 33 were men. Generally, it's about 50-50. Probably the next 100 patients that I come to, it might be the reverse. So we don't make too much of that. But 70 percent of uh, these 85 patients were uh, either completely pain-free or almost pain-free, and 75 percent of them were back to essentially unrestricted physical activity, and this was only six months. I suspect that some of these patients who may require psychotherapy will get better in time, so that if we do another survey another six months or a year from now, I expect that these figures will be even better. But that's pretty good in my estimation for a group of patients with severe pain problems that have been going on sometimes for months and years. Yes? Well, what were these patients suffering from? They were just like you. Disc problems, um, arthritis of the spine, spondylolisthesis, scoliosis, the whole kit and caboodle. All right, it's very important now that you be able to answer yes to all of these things. That is, I have little or no pain. I'm not afraid anymore. And remember, that may take some time. I'm not afraid to do physical things, and that may take some time. And I certainly don't intend to have any more physical treatments of any kind, because this is not a physical disorder. One word. What do we mean by little pain? We are not going to change. We said that before. Our personalities are going to stay the same, and that means that there will always be a tendency to have perhaps a little pain here and there. But your measure of success should be, am I limited in any way in my life? Does this stop me from doing anything? Does it interfere with my life in any way? As long as you can say, no, it's not, 
a little bit of TMS pain is okay. Thank you for your attention. Sure. Thank you. All right. Okay. <laughs> After attending my lectures, patients often ask me, now what do I do? The principle behind getting better is to understand what TMS is all about and to acknowledge that TMS and nothing else is the cause of your pain or your numbness or tingling or weakness, regardless of where you're feeling these things. It's important to remember your pain is due to TMS, not a structural abnormality. The direct reason for your pain is mild oxygen deprivation. TMS is a harmless condition caused by repressed emotions. The principal emotion is repressed anger. TMS exists only to distract your attention from the repressed emotions. Since your back is basically normal, there's nothing to fear. Physical activity is not dangerous, and to get better, you must resume all normal physical activity. You must not be concerned or intimidated by the pain. Becoming pain-free is all about shifting your attention from the physical pain to the emotional issues. Think psychological, not physical. This process takes time. Be patient and work at it daily, following the study guide enclosed with this video. As you now understand, Feelings generated in the unconscious mind can create real physical changes in our bodies. Most of these feelings have to do with who we are and the pressures of everyday living. So it's normal to have these feelings, and it's also normal to have physical reactions to them. You now also understand that these physical reactions can be stopped if we put our minds to it. This is a very good example of the power of the mind and what mind-body medicine is all about. In the words of Norman Cousins, we are stronger than we think, our bodies are tougher than we realize, and can deal with most illnesses and conditions that we get. And our minds can influence what goes on in our bodies and literally make us better in many situations. I hope this presentation will encourage and inspire you to capitalize on the power of your mind and body so that you can enjoy more comfortable, productive lives. I started to feel better immediately after the lecture, but I also realized that that wouldn't be enough. So I read Dr. Sarno's book, and I focused on the treatment strategies. And I guess it took a few months, but I started to see some results, and I started to think, you know, this is great. After I heard the lecture, I could start to identify what the source of the problem was when my back would start to uh, cause me a problem. I usually could pinpoint it to very specific areas of stress in my life. Uh, on the flip side, I could ski. Dr. Sarno was not saying um, that the pain is all in your mind at all. Dr. Sarno was saying that the pain originates uh, in your mind, that that is the cause of the pain, that the pain is a symptom, and that the pain is real. In fact, the pain is so real that it's making you concentrate on the pain and not on emotions that are uncomfortable to deal with. This was a totally uh, revolutionary concept for me. I started to understand why not everyone was, was getting better after surgery. I started to understand that why not everyone was getting better from all these physical techniques because the root of the pain is not a physical one but a psychological one. I had to turn things around and start thinking psychological instead of physical because at, to that point I had been programmed basically to think that it was all physically related. The most important thing to remember is that the brain is using pain to distract the conscious mind from the unconscious rage. I've learned that if you concentrate on the physical, you're never going to get better. You've got to concentrate on psychological issues, and then the pain starts to go away. Before I came in contact with Dr. Sarno, I was afraid to run, I was afraid to lift things, I was afraid to do practically everything. And then having seen him and gone to his lecture, I 
am now able to do the things that I had not done before. I, it's, it's, I, I feel free, basically. Someone freed me from this pain that I was in, and now I'm able to lead the life that I had before, the life that I wanted back. I still have flare-ups every now and then, and I think about it, and it just lifts. Uh, maybe a day, two the most. But, I mean, I had weeks of, I mean, weeks, years of, uh, of terrible pain where I was frightened to move, bend, twist. I was frightened to have a life. I'm not afraid to do anything now. Once I started to see that I got results from this, you get a little braver and you do a little more and you give up the fear and you find that you can do anything and that you don't have the fear that you used to have. I think I've come to learn that wanting the pain to go away really quickly sometimes causes it to hang on longer. And what you really have to remember is that you have to be patient. You have to put his work into practice on a very steady, very patient, very logical level and just keep at it. Absolutely keep at it. Don't doubt. Just go through it. Keep at it. You heal every day. You deal with it every day. You have to face it every day in how you cope with life. You can't just talk yourself into it and say, I believe, I believe, when deep down there's a fragment that it really doesn't believe, that you think you're going to get better just by saying, I believe. You truly have to accept the premise because the premise is a fact. And once you accept it, you're going to be better. I'm feeling great. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm a 9. And when I was hobbling around, I was a 4 <laughs> or a 3. Being pain-free um, is great. I mean, if you've lived with pain a long time, going back to doing everything you did before, doing new stuff is, I mean, you can't put a price on that. Dr. Sarno and, and his philosophy has really given me my life back. Dr. Sarno truly is my little miracle worker. Without him, I don't know what would have happened to me. And I'm able to have my life back. And I, I can't say enough about him. I really, he's just a remarkable man. I think Dr. Sarno is a diamond. But he's a diamond that doesn't cut. And I think he's great. And I think we should all be thankful for people like him and what he has done and how he has saved many people from surgery and from pain. I am feeling well. I feel relieved. I feel uh, unburdened. I feel very privileged to have met Dr. Sarno and worked with him. Um, it's, um, it's something that is a blessing, and I wish more people would know about it.